afternoon, everybody. My name is Brian Perry. Um, I used to be at Ilry up until about five years ago. Uh, so, so come on, I mean, when you, you came in, um, I think I was off quoted as uh, saying you were a breath of fresh air to me. Uh, you, you were greeted with scattered clusters of successful research, very dispersed, uh, and a negative corporate identity. And you, you have somehow brought cohesion and, uh, and, and turned this round, a, a, a mission under the umbrella of pro poor contributions of livestock. This is called the Serre Legacy. In one sentence, what do you think the Serre Legacy is? One sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and quick. <laughs> You're supposed to think on your feet, Carl. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm very tall, so it takes some time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, certainly the, the issue of how you use livestock to address sort of the world's problems, which go beyond the livestock sector, as what you said a, a minute ago. I think seeing livestock not just in its own value, but as a tool for development, I think that's what I would hope uh, be, be ingrained in the culture. Just okay, and... But in that, does that match with, under your tenure, you've been seen as the guardian angel of the struggling smallholder farmer. Um, but as we heard in Mario's talk, Hillary has emphasised the importance of value change, which by its implication means focus on other players for whom livestock play a role. And in, in processes of, of, of uh, development, uh, in many developed countries, the smallholders become a dodo. Uh, so, uh, should Ilri not be more involved in poverty reduction through livestock, which brings in uh, different scales of, of livestock production? Well, obviously this is a very central question, and I think we probably have treated smallholders as a homogeneous crowd, and many of the discussions have sort of treated them as sort of this one solution. I think more and more we realize that there is smallholders who can tap into value chains and markets. And I think if you look at the dairy development in India, it shows that it can be done and it's done with millions and millions of smallholders. We also see smallholders in many other value chains successfully operating. You think about coffee, tea, many other commodities. So smallholders can do that if the environment is appropriate. And I think in many countries, this has not been the case, and that's a bias against smallholders, and it promotes large-scale production in many cases, because the policy environment, the, the state has failed to provide the basic services. So large-scale people can do that internally in the company, while smallholders can. So but I I'm think talking, there is a role. But I'm talking about this this mixture. I mean, in, in Ethiopia, for example, of looking at uh, various scales of operation and how they link uh, rather than and the roles of livestock because of the larger the smaller scale being able to feed off some of the resources and services of, of larger scale should that not be more of a should we not be more um, broader looking in in, uh, in the roles of livestock and poverty reduction well for sure we should be broader looking that understanding in many cases smallholders will transit out of, of, of agriculture but it's going to take many, many years in many locations. So even if we believe that in the long run they won't be there, there is a social problem there. And the instruments, the smartest instruments to help them may be deficit payments, maybe cash transfers, or they may be in some cases developing a market for a commodity they can produce. I think we need to be much more open in understanding that it's not just technological interventions, it's all sorts of policy, uh, institutional interventions which can make it happen. And it's the mix which will be very variable across locations, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, your strengths were arguably in developing a systematic approach for Ilri, but some might say your weaknesses were that few people outside Ilri understood it. Uh, is that fair? <laughs> Probably, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because here you have, uh, and, and also with relating to your partners, uh, you've been developing, uh, wanting to have impact. Uh, and I noticed that Tom Randolph was very impertinent on his video saying that, that, that for the first time, Ilri, through the new CRPs, is going to have impact. Uh, uh, so, um, is, but is not the problem that many of your development partners, through whom that impact will have, don't understand some of the, uh, the complexities of the, of the way that Ilri was structured and, and, and these different programs? 
Do you think that was a, is that a challenge in making, in having impact happen? In other words, your ideas, but people have to di pass those through very traditional disciplinary uh, departments and environments. Yeah, I would certainly agree that that is a, is a big challenge. I think the art is to drive the agenda and be ahead of the pack, but not too far ahead so that people get disconnected from what you're doing. And I think we have had that challenge how you bring along a lot of other partners in understanding that the solutions are not just a new grass or a new breed, but that the solutions imply, in many cases, institutions. And I think the interesting thing is, if you think about small the dairy development, which is, I think, our most successful intervention, we started with a technological approach, we realized it didn't work, we had to move much more towards markets and institutions, and then, now, for example, in the EADD program, we see that when you start sorting out those constraints, then there is a real demand for technology and people do need that, but it's in a different context. They've moved, you've overcome a certain number of barriers, and then technology definitely plays a key role. Now, the reality is that there's an enormous number of other players providing that technology at that stage, and we see a lot more interaction with the private sector and others. And thinking through what we do in that context, I think, is a, is a challenge. Um, You've always led uh, uh, emphasized integration of disciplines and, and approaches. Um, but, a, but, a, but a couple of, of um, little examples of this. One, one of this uh, in partnership with, um, with FAO. Now, uh, I, I would sort of, the great international facilitator of delivery of the livestock technologies and the knowledge. But that relationship is embarrassingly weak, almost non functional in some areas. Is it? Or what would you say to that? Well, that's a... Uh, where is Maldivo? You should kind of on your side. <laughs> no, he, he, got, he got me up to ask him a question. No, he didn't. Well, I think he, he has mentioned, I think, that uh, we as researchers are not the ones developing the normative approaches and, and trying to distribute them. We, I always say our challenge is to to question FAO. Is this the best way to do this type of solution or address small holders and so on. So by definition, by being a research organization, we're asking questions, we're challenging the state of cool. This is the nature of science. And therefore, we will not always be 100% in agreement. But I think that challenge, for example, in terms of long shadow, we've had lots of discussions. And I think I would claim that some thinking in FAO has evolved to look at it in a more comprehensive way than sort of the initial documents were. And so, okay, well, let's just take, let's just take the long shadow. That's a good, a good idea. How much damage to Ilri did the dark shadow, the long shadow report to? I mean, uh, <laughs> were you caught by surprise? No, I don't think we were caught by surprise. I think we, we knew what that team was doing and we have discussed it many times. And I think that the, the fundamental difference was that our mandate as CGAR is to address poverty. And FAO's mandate is a much broader one of global food supply, of, of governance of the international food system, etc. So, but my question is, what was the communication? Because after it came out, Ilri then did uh, an awful lot of work to try and say, well, no, of course, it's not quite right, and we're looking at poverty and so on. So uh, was there not adequate communication in, 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 on understanding of what they were going to say? Could there have been a more harmonious uh, report that came out if Hillary had been more engaged? Because it, it did damage Hillary, didn't it? I don't know if it damaged Hillary. I think it raised the relevance of the bads a lot. And in a way, put Hillary also to think a lot more on that. If you look at our 2002 strategy, which you were very much involved in developing, <laughs> we didn't say very much about the bads in those days. Yeah? So nowadays, we do look at the bads a lot more. Long shadow, yeah, let's do that. Uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> that was when you first started. Um, okay, now you placed the science leadership, this was an issue in your early uh, tenure, in, in the hands of the program directors, and you called them directors instead of scientists, yes. uh, who, who then were then hands off. In retrospect, uh, was that correct? <laughs> Because the, the issue is still on the table, I understand. 
Well, I'm not sure this is Dr. Jimmy, <laughs> whether the issue is on the table or not. But let me tell you the thinking, how we, we decide. It was a very controversial discussion. Are these people program leaders or directors? We argued at the time the partnerships were going to be critical. We needed to engage the development partners. The fact that there was a director coming to talk to World Food Program or FAO or Heifer International, that it opened a lot of doors in the partnerships if people had director of the business card. And so really, I think it was much more a marketing tool than necessarily that the job of a director is significantly different than the job of a leader. We expected them to lead the science. What I did always argue was that we were expecting people to be in those positions who would have done their academic research and would have their spurs earned. They would not be trying to publish and compete with their own scientists, but they would mentor other scientists. And I think that still is the right decision. Uh, we clearly felt that you needed a lot of effort to manage scientists in this new way. You couldn't do that and at the same time have your own pet area where you're doing your own research. So I stand to that. I think if it was wrong, but I certainly believe that that was a way to manage in a very complex time when people needed to take a lot of other jobs. If they had a particular pet area, they would sort of bias the allocation of resources across areas. Okay, so you got that one right, you say. So looking back over this period, uh, is there one thing that you could pick out that you say, my goodness, I really got that wrong? I lost. <laughs> I'm not sure what to share with you. <laughs> okay, just pick out one that you really feel that you would like to share. Yeah. Well, I, I think if you ask me, internal communications. I think we should have invested a lot more in internal communications. I think we wanted to have quite a dramatic change, and we were so busy with a number of the partnership and other issues around that, that the effort was very much towards the outside and to raising resources, etc. And in a way, we may have lost the troops at times uh, by not communicating enough. And I should say, probably the mistake was to think that ICTs and intranet, etc. were going to do the trick and probably would have taken a lot more face-to-face, -face, but there were competition for time. That's why we didn't do it. But I do feel that that is something, if I had a chance, I would have do, done differently.